All right, welcome back. In the last video, we um, came up with the joint load diagram. And in this video, we're going to come up with the internal reaction diagram. Now, uh, the way we do this is, again, we treat each element as a fixed end beam. OK, so you have element 1, 2, this is 3, and then you have 4 here. And here, we just uh, calculate the fixed end moments and the fixed end shears um, that resist this loading, right? So you have 18 kips going down, then you have 2 kip per foot going down on a span of 24 feet. And um, that means you have a total of 66 kips going down. In order to resist that, we have on both sides, we have uh, 33 kips going, oops, 33 kips going up, right? And for our fixed end moments, again, if you just calculate the fixed end moments, we have 150 kip foot going clock uh, counterclockwise and then uh, 150 kip foot going clockwise right resisting this loading um, for the second uh, element uh, we have two kip per foot going down uh, over 18 feet so that's a total of 36 kips um, so that means we have 18 kips going up on the left 18 kips going right or going up on the right and then again you have your fixed end moments and these have a value of uh, 54 kip foot 54 kip foot again element 3 is the same as element 2 so you have a moment here you have a moment here uh, they're both 54 kip foot this is 54 uh, kip foot and then you have a vertical reactions or two vertical reactions right on the left and right of both 18 kips 18 kips and they're both going up right and again now we do element 4 element 4 is very similar to element 1 right because the beam is symmetrical the loading is symmetrical and the joints are symmetrical so that means you have a, a reaction here 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 and here and the reaction is 33 kips 33 kips uh, you have 150 kip foot and you have 150 kip foot okay so we came up with the joint load diagram and the internal uh, reaction uh, diagram so what are these diagrams good for well that's a very good question um, because the next step in the problem is to figure out what your JL complete vector is, or your column vector, right? And your JL complete is your joint load column vector unrestrained over your joint load um, vector restrained. And I'm under a little dotted line here. Okay. So, how do we, or actually, okay. Let me do the joint load diagram or the joint load column vector in green, the unrestrained. And how do we figure out what values are in this joint load unrestrained column vector? Well, we always, um, well, the U stands for unrestrained, right? So that means we do all of our unrestrained degrees of freedom first. And remember, if you Remember this diagram, our unrestrained um, is our theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3 at B, C, and D. And those are rotational degrees of freedom, right? So we look at our joint load diagram. And let me actually write um, A is here, right? B is here, C is here, D is here, and E is here. So we look at B. And our first degree of freedom is a rotational one. That means at this joint B, we look at all the rotations going on here. In this case, we have a 150 kip per foot going counterclockwise, and we have a 54 kip per foot going clockwise. And if you remember, our sign convention for computer methods is counterclockwise. So counterclockwise uh, is positive. So at this joint, you have a 150 positive and you have a negative 54 um, here. So 
If you add these two together, because B is a shared joint, right? Shared from the end of element, the right end of element one and the left end of element two, all your rotational ones are 150 minus 54. So uh, 150 minus 54 is 96. Actually, let me do that in green so it matches the degree of freedom. 96. Our second degree of freedom we look up here um, is this one here, 2, right? Theta 2, and that's a rotational degree of freedom. And so if we come back down to this diagram, uh, notice that for C, we have a positive 54 here, and we have a negative 54 here. That means the joint load at C, unrestrained, is 0, right? 54 minus 54 is 0. And then we look at D, that's a positive 54 minus 150, that's a negative 96. And so that becomes our joint load unrestrained. And these units, remember, are in kip foot. Now, what about our, let me do that in black so it matches, what about our joint load restrained? That, well, we're done with all the unrestrained, right? So now we come up and we look at um, our restraint. So we had one, two, three, now we do four. Four is a rotational degree of freedom at joint A. So if you look at joint A, oops, on the joint load diagram, you see here we have a 150 kip per foot and it's going um, opposite of this positive sign convention, so that means this is negative 150. Right? For 5, our fifth degree of freedom is a rotational one here at E. And that's, that is a positive 150 kip per foot. So we put 150 here, and that's positive. Now, our sixth degree of freedom is this vertical one here at A. And that's a restraint because it's in red, right? So if we come back down here, uh, we have, at A, we have a, a negative 33, right? It's going down. And our positive sign convention says positive is up. So here we have a negative 33. Our seventh degree of freedom is this delta 7. So that means the vertical reaction is happening at degree of freedom number 7 and that's located at joint B. You have a negative 33 and you have a negative 18. So that's going to give you a negative 51, right? Negative 51. Uh, then you have, uh, let's do 8, 9, and 10, and they're both, they're all, all three of them are vertical, and that's happening at C, D, and E. So let's look at uh, C first. C is right here. You have a a negative 18 and you have a positive 18 uh, and that's negative 36 okay and then at D you have a negative 18 and a negative 33 so that's also negative 51 right and then finally here you have a negative 33 and you put a negative 33 here okay and just note that the first two um, are in kip foot these two and the rest are in kips. Okay, so if we write out our joint load complete matrix, um, our joint load complete matrix says all the unrestrained joint loads are on top and all the restrained joint loads are on bottom in order of the degrees of freedom, meaning we start at 1 and we go 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 10. So we have a, a 96, we have a 0, negative 96. I'll just draw a little line to differentiate between the unrestrained and the restrained. Then we have a negative 150, 150, 33, and that's negative, negative 51, negative 36, negative 51, and negative 33. So this is our joint load complete matrix. All right. Um, I think we'll save the 
FM matrix or the fixed moment matrix um, for the next video. So this is how you figure out what the joint load complete matrix is. Um, and again, I'm going to make a video later on about um, why the joint load matrix, why it's drawn this way, and why we calculate and analyze this joint load matrix um, this way. So if you're confused, don't be. Just know that for this problem, joint load um, matrices, you do unrestrained first, then the restrained. Okay, so uh, for the fixed moment matrix, uh, we'll do that in the next video. So see you then.